Hi friends, my name is Tris, and this is No Boilerplate, focusing on fast, technical videos. I was taught formal methods at university, which included the languages Z, B, ACL2, and the excitingly named COC. Systems like pacemakers, autopilots, and hospital ventilators must be formally proved, not just rigorously tested, because human life is on the line. But formal methods are expensive requiring using unusual external verification languages, and most damning for web and application developers, they slow down iteration. After graduating from university and getting a web development job, I despaired that the safety and guarantees of the formal systems that I had been introduced to weren't available to me as a web developer. I was going to have to act if I wanted to live in a different world. So I did what any engineer would do, and I took to Stack Overflow. You can read my desperation in the question here, in what turned into my most popular Stack Overflow post. One of the last answers I received, all those years ago, very sympathetically said, I'm not sure whether what you ask for is actually what will make you happy. I didn't know what he meant, until I found Rust after previously trying Haskell. Everything you see in this video, script, links and images, are part of a Markdown document available freely on GitHub under a public domain license. Part 1. Haskell. I adore Haskell. In my How to Learn Rust video, I recommended learning the basics to teach you functional programming quickly. The language has many incredible features that give me similar confidence to using formal methods. And the one I'll highlight today is functional purity, which is a term you might be familiar with. In Haskell, and maybe kinda Rust, it's a first class feature. The first function here, factorial, is a pure function. A function that doesn't cause or rely upon side effects. We know this without reading the function body, because it doesn't have IO in the signature. The second function, main, prints to the screen, and so must have IO. This is a fantastic way to keep side effects managed, and covers half of the nightmare errors I've seen throughout my career. But just like formal methods, Haskell, my beloved, is too complicated to use for general programming. Formal methods are for proving the critical state machine of your autopilot, or proving that your pacemaker never stops beating the patient's heart. They are very theoretically sound, but impractical. Normal popular programming languages are very practical, but not theoretically sound. I realise now that this was probably what Apfelmus was telling me here. I would hate having to use formal methods to prove my web apps, just as I'd probably dislike coding them in Haskell for similar reasons. I need to compromise. My research moved on to what I consider the best compromise available to us, ML-inspired languages with their comprehensive compile time type safety, functional programming, and specifically, side effect elimination. I've had to cut for time a deep dive into formal methods, but the full ad-free video is available on my Patreon if you're interested. It's just me running this channel, and I'm so grateful to everyone for supporting me on this wild adventure. If you'd like to see and give feedback on my videos up to a week early, as well as get Discord perks and even your name in the credits, it would be very kind of you to check my Patreon. I'm also offering a limited number of mentoring slots. If you'd like one-to-one -one tuition on Rust, personal organisation, creative production, web tech, or anything I talk about in my videos, do sign up and let's chat. Part 2. Functional Programming Here are the broad strokes of my 15-year journey so far. I started with Scala. It has an advanced type system, which I knew was good for getting more logic checked by the compiler, and back in 2013, it had statically typed HTML built in, which was quite a trick. Then people told me Haskell was an even more powerful functional language, with a best-in-class purity system, and after a few rocky starts, I learned to appreciate the if it compiles, it works mindset. But I think that Haskell's narrow, high-level niche and esoteric ML syntax is holding it back from wider adoption. It's the best language in the world, no doubt, but that's not all we must consider in the real world. Clojure, the most popular modern Lisp, built on the JVM, came close for me. It was so popular I was able to join a startup bank and get paid to code it for two years, imagine that. But as with nearly all Lisps, it has no compile time type system. Though I know about typed Clojure, it's an ugly add-on, not a core part of the language. Same problem as TypeScript and Python and Ruby. Lisp's access to compile time changed my life with macros, and you know how that ended. Nim was a huge revelation. This language reads like Python, but compiles to fast static binaries, with almost every single good design choice I wanted, but its garbage collector and obscurity made me move on, despite recent impressive work with the ARC and OARC subsystems. Go very nearly worked for me. Fast, lower level compared to all others on this list except for Rust, and is multi-paradigm, with a strong showing from functional programming. But Go is inelegant. And I don't mean the syntax, beauty is in the eye of the binary holder, and you'll never get two people to agree upon that. If anything, it's too practical. 
There's no beauty to be found in Go, just a sort of crushing march of efficiency, and I don't mean that as a compliment. It's got the practicality of a chainsaw, but what I want is a poem that cuts just as sharp. In 2020, after a few false starts, I found Rust. And I have great news. Rust is more functional than I realised until recently. The functional ML roots of the language, Graydon's first Rust compiler was written in OCaml, shine through, influencing it right from the start. It's not C++ but better. It's Haskell standing on Lisp's shoulders, hiding in C's coat to sneak into production, the fancy nightclub where all the popular languages hang out. Let's look at how Rust can manage side effects. Here is the classic setup I include in all of my Rust projects, pretty and simple error handling with color air, and the RS test testing framework. The most important feature for me is its ability to use fixtures. Later on, I'm gonna use these two cool crates to demo the utility of Rust's functional techniques today. Rayon is the simplest parallelism library you've ever seen, built on Rust's controlled side effect system, and const panic allows string formatting for asserts in a const context. Enable all these lengths, allow individual lines if you need to. VS Code or your editor will likely use Clippy behind the scenes, but you must also run Clippy in a terminal to answer the most important question, what was the first error, as that's the one you have to fix. And as a bonus, here is a reasonable starting point for optimising the size of your release builds, cutting a Hello World down from 3 meg to 300k. You can get it down to 8k if you really want to, but I recommend stopping here and starting building. Here is our test module setup. Everything you see in this video from now on will be inside this module. All of my code examples are concatenated into main.rs and compiled. This is how I statically type my literate programming videos. See my repo for details. I'm importing the rs test prelude, which pulls in test attributes such as fixture here, which runs this line ahead of every test, setting up color as pretty errors. Most modern languages have these functional light features. JavaScript, Go, Python, and Ruby all have most of these. They are hugely useful, and Rust of course has them all, as well as a few more. But Rust has a killer feature. Rust has pure functions. Kind of. If you want to write code that you can reason about and guarantee, pure functions are wildly useful. Pure functions are good neighbours. They don't look through your windows or throw junk in your garden. Normal functions can do anything, which means you have to read the code to figure out what they are doing. Pure functions utility comes from their limitations. They can't do everything. They are functions where their output only depends on their inputs, and they have no side effects. For example, memory or I.O. If your language has a way of separating or tagging functions that are pure, and then can hold you to that contract, both you and the compiler can reason about your code in useful new ways. If a pure function is called twice with the same inputs, the result is guaranteed to be the same every time. This is called referential transparency, or idempotence, or determinism. This enables perfect predictable caching of return values, which your compiler might do automatically, and easier debugging. Pure functions that don't cause side effects also allow perfect parallelization. The functions can run on separate threads, processes, machines, or even in different geographic data centers. Their output is only affected by their inputs, so you can bundle the inputs with the functions and they can run anywhere. And if a pure function is never called, it can be automatically removed by the compiler, or ignored by the developer. Early on in its development, Rust had a pure function system, just like Haskell. It was abandoned because it was soon discovered that the language had already solved many of the problems that a pure function system would guard against. The compiler and developer don't usually need further function annotation to understand the side effects of functions. The type system and language already encodes that to an enormous extent. I'll talk more about that later. But if you really want a function purity system in Rust, like I do, there kind of is one. If you've set up Clippy, like I recommended, this simple Rust function from earlier will not compile. What on earth could be wrong with it? Clippy tells us that this function could be a const function. This error was my first clue that Rust is doing something interesting. The fix, as ever, is to do what Clippy says, obey the compiler and turn the function into a const function. Obey the compiler merch available at noballerplate.org. Const functions are functions that can be executed at compile time as well as runtime. They differ from Rust macros, which can only run at compile time and can do anything, by being much more limited. And just like with pure functions, these limits make them exciting. Const functions have access to a limited subset of Rust. You could read about it here, but let's experiment because that's more fun. By the way, if you're curious, the const crate has const equivalents of many standard library functions and methods that are in the process of being made const compatible in the standard library. So what can we do in a const function? And perhaps more importantly, 
What can we not do? Well, it's obvious that a lot works here. Arithmetic operators on ints and floats, tuple creation and indexing, arrays and array slicing with use size, struct creation and use, closure expressions without capturing, shared borrows, except for borrowing of values with interior mutability, casting, except for casting to memory addresses, calling other const functions, loop while, while let, and if, if let, and match, no proper for loop yet, though it's being worked on, and range expressions. That's quite a lot. But not everything. And some of what works is qualified. What's the pattern? And is it all pure? Let's look at some examples to find out. No mutable references. Well, that makes sense. That would leak our side effects into calling code. What else? No interior mutability. OK, good. Mutability in state is what we're trying to avoid with purity. No string comparison. OK, that's interesting. But we can work around that. Only partial floating point support. Even with allowing floating point arithmetic with a crate attribute, see my source code for details, not all floating point operations seem to be supported. And this is to do with the side effect that your processor, from the code's point of view, isn't dependent on the inputs to your pure function when doing floating point operations. Change the target, change the floating point hardware, and you could get a different output for the same input. If you think about it, const functions aren't weird for disallowing them, it's the rest of us who are weird for assuming they work. No iteration. OK, iteration is not possible without using a crate like const. The state held inside an iterator is inherently challenging in a const environment. For loops and ranges are partially supported, but as soon as they start allocating, side effects become a challenge. Some of this may become possible in future versions of Rust, I would imagine. Most release notes for even minor versions of Rust mention functions that have now been tweaked to be const compatible. Rust disallows any mutating iter methods, which is like nearly all of them. This is how it works for the whole standard library, by the way. For example, none of the file system handling functions are marked as const. Because, of course, that's a big side effect. You can't print either, this is a big one. Because you can only call functions that are marked as const from a const function, you can't print to the screen. IO functions like print can't be called safely because they cause the side effect of printing to the screen. This feels very similar to how IO functions in Haskell work and makes me quite excited for their potential purity. So when debugging, the only way to get information out of a const function is by its return type or halting compilation with a panic or a failed assertion, like in the first code block here. Because there's no runtime difference with making a function const, most of the standard library's functions that can safely be called from a const context are already marked const and ready to use. So printing isn't possible, but if you take my advice, you'll debug with the compiler not printing to the screen, and I love Rust's compiler-driven development workflow. Note that only simple error messages are available in const assertions. You can't use string formatting to interpolate values. But in the second code block, the const panic crate provides const versions of assertions that panic with an error message with variables and other useful context. Const functions are looking great so far, but there is a caveat to my dreams of purity. To illustrate this caveat, and to button up our understanding of const functions, let's look at environment variables. Of course you can't read them from const functions, that's wildly out of scope. It's the host's operating system environment, a huge bundle of state that we don't want to be influenced by, nor influence. But oh no, the macro version of standard env is allowed in a const function. What is happening here? This is not pure at all. Don't worry. You will find this pattern in Rust again and again. Strict rules, but with well signposted concessions to practicality. Just like the safety hatch of unsafe, const functions have their own escape hatch macros. Macros execute arbitrary code at compile time and then can insert the results of that processing as potentially const values. Like here, the result of interrogating the path is a const static string. Here's how I think about it. Rust's const functions are only pure once you get to runtime. Once you understand this small caveat, you can still get enormous benefits from these pure-ish functions. Most of my code runs at runtime despite my best intentions. I want pure business logic functions to be predictable, never change based on runtime state, and never cause unpredictable side effects in other runtime systems. OK, this isn't proper Haskell-style purity, Rust doesn't have a single purity system. But does that matter? What it does have is a sort of granular purity built into the whole language. Rust's design 
means that the advantages of a purity system are less necessary than in less strict programming languages. See the first code block, everything is immutable unless you opt in to mutability. And that is clearly signposted by the function signature telling you what can and can't be mutated. Global state is deliberately discouraged by the language and ecosystem. Look at the second ugly code block here. Rust promotes side effect free patterns and functional and reactive programming. The whole language is already aligned to solve the problems that a purity system solves in other languages. And Rust does so without sacrificing practicality like Haskell and formal methods do. By the way, this built in granular control of side effects is how Rayon is able to turn most iterators into parallel iterators with a single line change to your existing code. Encoding side effects into the type system allows you and the compiler and smart crates like Rayon to reason about the soundness of parallel code without a restrictive, gated purity system. So, are const functions pure in Rust? No. They're better than that. They're practical. Rust is as pure as possible, but no purer. Thank you. If you would like to support my channel, get early ad-free and tracking-free videos, VIP Discord access, or one-to-one -one mentoring, head to patreon.com forward slash noboilerplate. If you're interested in transhumanism and hope punk stories, please check out my weekly sci-fi podcast, The Lost Terminal. Or if urban fantasy is more your bag, do listen to a strange and beautiful podcast I produce every full moon called Modem Prometheus. Transcripts and compile checked markdown source code are available on GitHub, links in the description, and corrections are in the pinned errata comment. Thank you so much for watching. Talk to you on Discord.